All right, Bills looking good and feeling good after three preseason games. Welcome to the Buffalo End Zone Podcast, everyone. I'm Kevin Carroll. And I'm John Scott. It was quite a quite a effort to get this podcast up and rolling, but Kevin, I think we're we're finally gonna do it. And you know, only good things for us to round out the preseason. Yeah, we're up and rolling, but we have a miniature Kevin Carroll next to a giant John Scott right now on screen for you but I'm not the center of attention here the Buffalo Bills are the center of attention Josh Allen's the center of attention John and head coach Sean McDermott electing to play his starters once again after a total dud in Pittsburgh a week ago against the Bears Josh Allen offense and defense John look good in this one as they get ready to start the regular season And this is what we discussed going into the game. What do we need to see once we knew that the starters were going to play? And I think we saw on both sides of the ball even more than you and I felt felt we needed to see or or were looking to see from them. I I just wanted to see them move the chains a little bit and, and even look marginally better than they did in Pittsburgh, which was not really that tall of a bar to clear. And lo and behold, they come out and have a great 12 play 72 yard drive takes up 635 converted on three third downs and found the end zone it was it was a really good drive to see out of the first team offense first team defense a couple three and outs it, it was it was great they looked good talked to Mitch Morse and Taron Johnson in the locker room afterwards just to get an idea of, of how necessary it was for the the first teams to come out there and play better than they did the week before and they agreed it, it was important. Yes, we understand preseason is preseason and things are going to be not perfect and they don't need to be. But it was something good that, as Moore said, we can now carry over into the regular season, not only just from an execution standpoint, but there is some element of having confidence that, hey, we know we can do it. But then we did do it. And, and I think the big buzzword I heard from Taron Johnson and even Mitch Morse was, energy they just felt like they had a lot more energy and were a lot more focused and had more juice coming out the gate against the Bears here in the final preseason game than certainly they did a week ago in Pittsburgh against the Steelers yeah you heard Josh Allen say that as well said that they were more ramped up this week uh during the broadcast uh Brandon Bean talking to in the uh booth with Steve Tasker and uh, the other guy there whose name is escaping me that Stefan Diggs was all worked up like it was a regular season game day when they were getting ready to go and you know for the national outlets who said going into this game that Stefan Diggs not happy he looked really happy in this game in fact he looked like John at times he kept wanting to play him and uh, Josh Allen connecting on a couple of big plays on that one drive they were both in. Yeah, two catches on two targets for Diggs. There was one he was unhappy with himself that he didn't elude the tackler and and break a big play there. The offense, just everyone on the first-team offense and first-team defense, I mean, they just they looked in sync. It was also our first looks. James Cook looked good. We saw Damian Harris get his first run of the preseason as a member of the Bills, whether it was Diggs, whether it was Davis. I mean, everyone seemed to be in a flow. And it looked good. And, and again, not to you know really belabor it, we didn't need to see some Herculean effort or, or complete pivot from, from what we saw a week ago. I think Herculean is what Morse told me was a phrase he used. No, they, they didn't need something like that. But it was certainly good to, to see them look like the Bills offense and Bills defense that we expect them to be come the regular season. Yeah, and Damian Harris was one of the big questions going in. I liked what... You saw from Cook, uh, and then Damian Harris. It that first drive, John. They did what you basically thought that offense was all about. Defense comes out, gets a three and out. Bills get the ball, march down the field, and punch it in with Damian Harris from two yards out. Who I thought Damian Harris looked really good. I was wondering how that injury would hamper him because we haven't been able to see him play in any preseason games, but uh, he's got a pretty good resume from his time against the Bills with the Patriots, and he looked the part for sure. Right, and it was Cook, you know, outside the red zone, and then they bring in Damian Harris for goal line work, and maybe that's what you'll see. 
We didn't see Latavius Murray play. No, no injury, nothing. I think just, you know, he's the oldest running back in the league. He's looked good. You know what you have in him. Leave the reps more to Harris to find his way since he hasn't been able to have preseason action to this point uh, because of injuries and whatnot. So uh, maybe that was just a little, little inside look at how maybe snaps will be distributed. And I know from a fantasy standpoint, uh, drafts are going on and people who are looking uh, and trying to figure out how the Bills running backs will be divided. Maybe uh, Cook may be the guy who, who gets you there, but Harris may be the one that, that ultimately more times than not is the one who punches it in. Yeah, offensive line, John, in this one, I thought, you know, a lot more discipline for sure in this game with, you know, not the pre-snap mistakes made by the offensive line. But uh, depth is going to be a question mark right here, as we saw as the game went on. Now that first offensive line looked good, but the depth right now is not in a good spot with that offensive line. And as we go through this podcast and, and – we said going into it, you look at the third preseason game through the lens of who is playing when, and that'll give you your best indication of where they stand in terms of the roster bubble. And as you said, here's what the second offensive line was from left tackle over. It was David Questenberry, Ike Bucker were the ones who were there, and then Ryan Bates came in to center. And then it was uh, Kevin Jarvis, and uh, Alec Anderson is a guy that was playing tackle. He also played some guard. He's played a lot of center. Uh, so you're right. If the swing tackle position, Ryan Vandemark didn't come in until much later. And he's someone that I thought was probably after David Questenberry was like your fourth tackle now because they just don't really have anybody. Interesting to see Anderson out there playing tackle as well. I, I just I don't remember seeing that even in, in the practice setting. So – Maybe that's something where they're trying to see, all right, if, if, if we know we have a lot of versatility on the interior, they like Anderson, a young guy. If he can play tackle, all right, maybe he provides more versatility and, and, and just has more value to them than a guy like Ryan Vandemark. We'll see, but I agree going into the game. Tackle depth was still a question, and I think you still have that question coming out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the uh, position battles going on during the summer. Uh, I think we have a clearer picture right now of that cornerback two battle. We'll look at the defense. Start out with a couple of three and outs. Very impressive, John. And as things go on, Christian Benford got the start in this one opposite Tredavious White. And I thought for sure looked the part to me that he – could be the starter we still have Dane Jackson with more experience but that right now is leaving Kyer Elam as the guy fourth on the depth chart on the cornerback two spot the former first round pick but like Christian Benford John I thought kind of he he looked great in this one out there running with the first offense he looked really good and he looked like someone that should he be the one that trots out there opposite Tredavious White against the Jets on Monday Night Football week one? I don't think anyone's going to have a problem with it. I don't think anyone's going to say, no, we, they, they, he's not ready. He's not capable. I, I think he showcased that. And, yeah, it's the third preseason game, but I think they wanted to see, because Dane Jackson had gotten the starts the first two preseason games, I think they wanted to see what Benford could do, put it into that position. And I think he fared very, very well. And then when you just take into account his full body of work dating back to last year, before he got hurt, I thought he played really well as well. So uh, it will be curious to see how they ultimately settle that decision between him and Dane Jackson. And then, as you said, we can pivot the conversation, and we kind of had it going into the game, as to what do we think the future holds for Kyir Elam because – a guy like a year ago, different circumstances, but when you see certain players playing deep into the third preseason game, the antenna needs to go up. A year ago, it was O.J. Howard in the final preseason game. Wow, he did you realize, Kevin, that he was playing deep into the <laughs> second half of the final preseason game? I thought he was a lock, and then lo and behold, he was the, the biggest surprise cut. I'm not saying Kyrie Elam's going to get cut, but where do you see his future with this team if he truly 
is fourth in the pecking order and depth chart at cornerback. Well, that's what I was going to say is, again, Brandon Bean talking during the broadcast about the depth at the cornerback position and what they have right now. They like it all from top to bottom, but you're going to have a first-round draft pick be a depth guy, fourth on the depth chart at the cornerback two position, not even all of the corner positions He's young enough. You could probably still, you touched on this before. You could get something for him because there sure are needs on this team right now for him. But I just, I don't know if over the next few days before the 53 man roster has to be set, if he'll be moved or not. I'm kind of, I'm kind of stuck at this is his second year. Maybe keep him and see how the season plays out. I, I could spin and be good with however it ultimately winds up. I think personally for Kyir Elam, it would be in his best interest to get a clean start somewhere else and maybe do so in a system that allows him to play the way he is best suited and most comfortable, and that is in a more press man predominantly ske- predominant scheme instead of you know continuing to try to learn the – zone scheme and develop and things like that because with a lot of it's like the same it's a similar conversation to my issue with them drafting dorian williams when you drafted terrell bernard the year before was what is the path for this guy to ever get on the field if he can't beat out dane jackson and christian benford right now young guys and christian benford drafted the same year as him then why what what path is he ever going to do i i just to me his value is only going to go down and he's not going to have the reps to truly develop the way that you want him to continue to develop as the fourth cornerback on the depth chart. I just, to me, from a roster building standpoint, I think it is, this is the time to strike. If you have any sort of market out there for Kyir Elam to try to trade him and get some of your value back, you're not getting a first round pick. Heck, you probably (laughs) maybe hard pressed to get a, a day two selection. I, I just don't, I don't know what his market is, but what's weird, Kevin, and, and you said it and others have, when I put this out on Twitter, it's not like he's looked horrible when he's been out there. That that's, that's the thing. It's just the other guys have been better and he has been inconsistent and he admits that. So maybe there is a market out there that's, that's bigger than, than maybe we would anticipate or others would anticipate. Um, I, I get the depth thing. I do, but I, I think, all things being equal, I think they would be fine with their fourth cor- fourth cornerback was Cam Lewis or Jamarcus Ingram, who was playing out there, or even Alex Austin, a guy they drafted late this past year. Jamarcus Ingram with the interception, John, in uh, the third preseason game. It makes me wonder why the Bills went after a press man coverage guy in the first round when that's not how this defense operates. And now here we are at the point where he's depth. There's other positions of need as they start to enter the season, John. And the middle linebacker position, John, is will stick to defense right now. I don't think there's anything. We're not closer to anything better right now through three preseason games. I thought Dodson... There were plays where he stood out, but there were plays where he looked bad in this one. I saw, and you would have to tell me because I was obviously at the game, but I I saw through other reporters saying on the broadcast, Brandon Bean indicated Terrell Bernard is close to returning, and they expect him maybe to practice, what, in the next week? Did you hear that on the broadcast? Yes, absolutely, yep. Okay, so Terrell Bernard was, was suited up and was warming up as if he was going to play before the game here today. So so that, you know, that all adds up there. And, and I think that maybe once again puts him maybe in line to start at middle linebacker. I think AJ Klein, he saw the field his first action was actually playing outside with Dodson continuing to stay in the middle today. Valen Spector got hurt. So uh, his status in terms of health moving forward, even though he's not in the mix to start at middle linebacker, just in terms of overall linebacker depth. I think if 
Spectre is hurt and out, then I think that helps AJ Klein making the team. But to me, I, I think it's Dodson's job with the caveat of let's see what Bernard is and does in practice when he's healthy enough to return, which I guess is, is going to maybe be this week. Yeah. And that's the case with uh, Dodson that I kind of look at as like they're watching the game. I have a few notes here and there that, okay, Dodson looked really good there, but then there were some where it was kind of questionable, like his reaction time. I think there was a, pass play down the middle where the effort to make a tackle just didn't look like it was there it looked like he was in practice just trying to tag the receiver there for the Bears so I think you're right I think that's where they are with Dodson and when you go into week one in the Jets game gets to start there but man you gotta kind of hope Terrell Bernard kind of as he works his way back uh gets that competition maybe going again because that's clearly a weak spot right now uh, with the Bills. Yeah, I I definitely believe that the hope is – I mean, they've wanted – the hope has been that someone took the job the the entire time, and that that just really hasn't happened to this point. I think you saw things from the cornerbacks. You saw Cyrus Torrance kind of take hold of – and assert himself ahead of Ryan Bates in the guard competition. Uh, we haven't seen it at the middle linebacker at all from anyone. And I, I think you're right. I, I think it's probably, I think maybe the way I, I read things and, and saw things today in Chicago, I think it's it's not, could it be A.J. Klein week one? I, I think it's Dodson, and then it's, let's see what a healthy Bernard can do to maybe change that if it's not week one, maybe uh, a week or so into the season. Yeah. The other big position battle going into the summer was O-line. I think we've addressed that ad nauseum. Osiris Torrance uh, is good to go there. Wide receiver depth, John. Um, have a different outlook on things with Shakir not playing in this one. Because you would think after the preseason that he's had – he would need to show something. I think he might be one of those guys by not playing might have helped him out. I think Andy Isabella working a little bit with the first offense early, not when Allen was out there. But as the game went on, he was still out there. Uh, and as you said, late into the game, he was still out there like they were looking for more, hoping for more opportunities from him. I think Justin Shorter had his moments. I was thinking going in to this game, might the Bills be going with seven wide receivers going into the season? I don't know if Andy Isabella did enough for me at the end of the day this summer that I see him on this roster. I think if I, – I, I think he has, so I'll start okay. there. I think, I think he has done enough. I actually think Justin Shorter struggled in this game. He had a couple drops. He one catch on five targets. Isabella had two on four targets. I just, to me, though, it's it's really been about the redundancy and the makeup of the wide receiver room as a whole. And I just, I can't foresee them keeping Deontay Hardy, Andy Isabella, Khalil Shakir I can't see them keeping all three of those and then moving on from Justin Shorter I just I don't foresee it is Shakir out in your opinion at this point no no I don't I I think which is interesting because people will probably say well if you're if you think that they should move on from Kyrie Elam why don't you think they should move on from Khalil Shakir I, I think it's too early I do and yeah I understand that's maybe weird to say because I I think that they should go in a different direction with Elam. But part of that is also, I think Kyrie Elam can be a good player still, not to go back into that. But I, And I think they still believe that Khalil Shakir can as well. And um, maybe they can get Isabella on the practice squad. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, when we go through the rosters uh, and my projections that, that I kind of went through as the game went along, I, I, he would be like number 54. There is a path I found 
to get seven wide receivers on the roster. I just don't think that they would do that. Okay. You know, we talked about Dodson, and I'm going to bring up Kyle Allen kind of in the same mode right now was you saw Kyle Allen do some things in the third preseason game. He got a lot more run, obviously, with Matt Barkley out, but an interception, uh, strip sack on one of them, but he did have that nice ball down the seam to uh, Quentin Morris. So, again, it was another up-and-down performance. Do you think we saw enough from Kyle Allen to feel comfortable that at some point when roster cuts are made, they are going to go out and bring in another quarterback because they just can't trust Kyle Allen to fill a gap if Josh Allen has to miss, say, a month or so. I think that they'll stick with Kyle Allen, but Brandon Bean said on the pregame show, Buffalo Kickoff Live, that and it was reported by others, but he he was open about it, that they, they did make calls and have conversations about potentially, or at least inquiring about the compensation of potentially trading for Trey Lance from the San Francisco 49ers, which is a really intriguing thought, which is funny because we made fun of people about it. <laughs> yes, uh, we did. In the show before. <laughs> um, I more so would have been curious about that in terms of, what that would have meant for Kyle Allen. I was talking to Sal Capaccio just real quickly about it after the game, and I said, do you think that they would have then kept three quarterbacks? Because I just I don't know if that you want Lance as such a developmental guy to be your primary backup like that. Um, and, you know, it obviously didn't happen. He thought that they would maybe would release Allen and Barkley, Kyle Allen and, and Matt Barkley, and try to get one, if not both, on the practice squad. But obviously it didn't happen. So... Bean said it, and I agree. This is true. He's, you know, a guy that touted and that highly picked. It's part of his job to inquire uh, about about that guy, and so he did. But it, it maybe it is a window of them saying, "Hey, we're, we're not completely satisfied with what the backup quarterback situation is here behind Josh Allen." Yeah. Um, let's get into this. I know you had talked to me about. Your final 53-man roster, you should have your hands around it right now. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, I I, uh, I have it I have it right next to me. Okay, so let's kind of dive into we'll, – we'll go on defense right now, John. You Do go you see that – huh? Want to start on defense, okay. I always start on offense. I'm going to change it up right now. Okay. okay. Uh, let's talk about that defensive line. I know a lot remains up in the air with what they're going to do with Vaughn Miller. But uh, do you see with the players that they have right now possibly going with five defensive tackles, five defensive ends on this 53-man roster? That is what I got. That's what I got right now. So and what that, are we looking at? So that would be, I believe, Von Miller will start on the pup list. I think he will remain there. I know, again, you can correct me because I wasn't listening to the broadcast, but I guess Bean did say that, that he's progressing and they still haven't made a decision on what to do with him. As I said on the show going into this Bears game, I think similar to how Vaughn didn't want to start training camp on the pup list, and Brandon Bean said, oh, no, we knew he was starting on the pup list for a while now. Right. I think I think they've known and had a pretty good feel that he was going to start on the pup list for the regular season as well. And I think with the play of their defensive line, I think pretty much everyone has, has been solid. And rather than making a tough decision now, maybe they can hold off making that decision for another month into the season. That also allows Vaughn to, again, just take it at a slow pace. There's no need for it. So, yeah, I got Ed Oliver, Daquan Jones, Jordan Phillips, Tim Settle, and Puna Ford. I got five interior defensive tackles, which is something I didn't think that I would do. But as I was going through it, I just I couldn't make a cut. I'm like, who who could you cut? And then I'm watching the game, and you you have those guys are in the mix with the the defensive line early in the game, and so I, I went that way, and I kept five defensive ends: I Greg Rousseau, Leonard Floyd, AJ Epinesa, Boogie Basham, and Shaq Lawson. Mm -hmm. And that that is that is not making any cuts on the ones. I mean, obviously Jonathan Kingsley is is a name you brought up because he was mentioned and asked. Uh, 
Eric Washington was Kingsley asked about him. Kingsley Jonathan. And, what did I say? Jonathan Kingsley? <laughs> yeah, you like to bust my chops. So I, oh. I'm taking I'm taking the time to bust yours. Go on. What a doofus. My bad. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Kingsley Jonathan. Um, so he maybe would be the only one of, you know, people really know. Um, and then, yeah, and then we'll have to see. There's injuries could happen. That, that can maybe sort itself out once Vaughn comes off the pup list after four weeks to then make them, you know, whether maybe be a trade or maybe somebody gets hurt or whatnot. So, yeah, so I, I got 10 defensive linemen, five defensive tackles, five defensive ends. What about the defensive backfield, John? Do you see Dean Marlowe making this roster with some of the other names out there in the defensive backfield? No, but I do technically have five safeties, technically, uh, I think number 53 on my roster is Cam Lewis. I think his versatility um, is what allows him to to stay. He could play outside corner. He could play inside corner. He's played safety basically for the past year. And I think he's also a core special teams guy. So I have him in, and I am making the assumption in general with the cornerback position that Kyrie Elam – in some capacity, I, I'm predicting I'm going to stay on my thought that he's going to get traded. Okay. Um, but if Kyrie Elam does not get traded, then Cam Lewis would probably be the one whose spot Kyrie Elam would take and be like number 52 or 53 on my roster. But I got Hyde, Poyer, Taylor Rapp, and Demar Hamlin. I mean, that's been pretty easy at the safety spot. And then Tredavious White, Dane Jackson, Christian Benford, Taron Johnson, and Saran Neal. Yeah, uh, that that's where I go. And um, so maybe similar kind of to the Von Miller status, pup or no pup is a, a big swing in terms of the defensive line. I think whatever way they decide to go and whatever happens with Kyrie Elam will be the swing in the secondary and Cam Lewis's fate, I think, would 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 rely on that. Interesting to find out as far as the linebackers go with you. I know we talked about. Tyler Medikevich going into this game, uh, and maybe he is one of the odd man out. What are you looking at when it comes to, and now you have the bail inspector issue with the injury there. So that unit overall, the linebacker unit as a whole. I'm keeping six, and the specter thing, to your point, is a wild card here. His leg was wrapped, but he was walking. Uh, out of the locker room when I saw him after the game. The easy ones are Matt Milano, Terrell Bernard, Tyrell Dodson, Dorian Williams. Those are the easy four. I had Balin Spector and Tyler Medikevich, and that was leaving A.J. Klein out. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like Medikevich's role on the special teams is just it, – it's it always carries such great weight. And I feel that – while Klein has been getting run with the first team at middle linebacker and, and, and can play both inside and out and all of that, I, I feel that the the special team's value of Tyler Medikevich, and they brought him back to do that, uh, I think that that holds weight. But if Spectre is hurt or has to go on IR or whatever it may be, <clears throat> excuse me, if something happens with him, then that would, that would give A.J. Klein a path to be the sixth linebacker. Okay, I know – I mean, offense, we started with defense. Offense, to me, seems there's not much to really dig into. And you can correct me if I'm wrong on this. But, you know, you look at the tight ends, that kind of, you know, plays itself out, you know, with Kincaid Knox and Quentin Morse. Um, Reggie Gilliam, okay, you convinced me. I've been – trashing Reggie Gilliam all year, but I guess he's someone who's needed with his special teams role. Uh, running back position looks normal. We can talk about wide receiver depth at this point and get your six on who you think will make the 53-man roster at wide receiver. Yeah, I think Andy Isabella is is the odd man out, and I like him. I do. I think, I think, he, had a, I think he did – just about as much as he possibly could to make a case to be make the team. I, I just think that Khalil Shakir, they trust him. He's their own draft pick from just a year ago, and I don't think Isabella did enough to warrant cutting bait on a 
fifth round pick from a year ago who had good moments simply because he, he's been hurt for the past week or, or right. whatever it may be. And certainly he had his inconsistencies. But then also one thing I want to bring back from the, the show before the game is you also got to got to play a little game in your head of who has a better chance of making it back onto your practice squad. I think mm. Andy Isabella maybe would surprise people. I think I think the Bills could maybe get him back on their practice squad. And if somebody gets hurt or if Shakir is out or whatever, he's a guy who warmed up, was in pads, and then ultimately didn't play today. So maybe he is closer to returning as well. Uh, I, I think – it's going to be the six of Stefan Diggs, Gabe Davis, Trent Shurfield, Deontay Hardy, Khalil Shakir, and Justin Shorter. And Justin Shorter basically will be a developmental guy who plays special teams but really has no role on the offense. And I think by running more 12 personnel or one and a half with, with right. Dalton Kincaid, I don't think you need to have six wide receivers that are always going to help you. That's another reason of you put Andy Isabella on the roster over Justin Shorter, let's say. Are you really trotting out and incorporating in the game plan? all six wide receivers, I don't think you are. Right. And so I just don't think that at the end of the day, I'm, I'm picking Shakir over Isabella, and I don't think it would ever be Isabella over Shorter. Yeah, I, I, I'm in agreement with you on that. Offensive line, John, I know we talked at the beginning of the podcast about uh, where they're at as far as depth goes at this point. So round out for me who you have then on the 53-man roster as far as the offensive line goes come Tuesday? I'm going nine offensive linemen. Deion Dawkins, Connor McGovern, Mitch Morse, Osiris Torn, Spencer Brown, Ryan Bates. We saw David Edwards get the start at left guard for the injured McGovern. Yeah. So I think that solidifies things of not only his roster spot, which I don't think was really in question going into this, but it also shows you truly what they think of Ryan Bates because, again, when we were talking about the right guard competition – We've only seen Ryan Bates play backup center. That's all he's played in preseason action. And interesting to see that maybe they just think he's better at center. Mm -hmm. I found it interesting that they wouldn't put him at left guard and they put uh, David Edwards. David Questenberry, I think right now, whether you like it or not, <laughs> is their swing tackle. And the last one is, is tough for me. I put Ryan Vandemark in here, but him basically being the last offensive lineman to get into the game makes me wonder – even though Alec Anderson did not look good at tackle, I think he's better on the interior. Alec Anderson may be a wild card, and it, and it could maybe come down to him and Ryan Vandemark for the uh, the final offensive line position. But I, I just feel like with Bates and Edwards being your interior guys, I, I think that you would you probably want a couple tackles out there uh, to round out your depth. Uh, that would obviously mean uh, Ike Bucker is kind of a guy that he was he was seeing good run early. Mm -hmm. I just again he's an interior guy. I just think they have so many interior depth, so much interior depth that um, they need that I would need the roster spot for someone who could who could play outside. I think we have a grasp of your 53 man roster. Is there a surprise or something in there that you think is coming up? before Tuesday or by Tuesday's deadline that might take people by surprise this year? I, I mean, I, I'm going to hold to my like bold prediction from before camp, and, yeah. and we touched on it. I, I think I think, a tr think a trade's going to happen. I, I'm pinpointing I'm going to stay on Kyrie Elam, but who knows? It could be somebody else. Like, like we said, they like Kingsley Jonathan. Can you get something – would they be interested or, or could they get a deal that would blow them away enough to trade Boogie Basham? I don't know. He got the start at defensive end opposite of Greg Rousseau in this one. So I don't foresee that as much, but maybe maybe that would happen. But I, I think a trade is in the works. And, and then who knows? I, I mean, it's also funny, the roster manipulations of, all right, some guys get cut, but you're like, hey, I just got to cut you because we got to – let's say put Khalil Shakir on the active roster and then put him on IR for four weeks or something, or Baylin right. Spector has to, we want him on the roster. So we're going to have to cut, you know, Tyrell Dodson, and then we'll just bring you back or something like that. Yeah, um, you know, it's roster manipulation, but I, I didn't get too crazy here. And, and so I'm not really predicting outside of a trade. I'm not really predicting 
But it, I do think maybe – I do think a new player might find their way in here, if not by cut day, uh, maybe before they play the Jets on Monday Night Football. I, I think whether it's tackle or middle linebacker, I, I think that there, there might be some addition of, of note – at one of those two spots before they play the Jets. Yeah, I think you're right right there. Cut down day coming up at 4 o'clock on Tuesday. John, Bills, they made it through the preseason healthy now. It's time to start getting ready for the New York Jets and Monday night football. Uh, some other notes. I don't know if you saw this. Tom Pellicero reporting the Eagles released Tyree Jackson, the former UB quarterback turned tight end. Uh so he's out there. I was going to bring up Trey Lance to you and how we look bad. Or people pointed out to me because I made a big deal that the Bills would be stupid to go after him. But I think I've said way more stupid stuff in my lifetime and probably over the last week than that the Bills shouldn't go after Trey Lance. You mentioned Tyree Jackson just got released by the Eagles. Steven Carlson, I didn't even realize he oh, was right, on the on Bears. Oh, right, on the Bears, yeah. <laughs> And he had he led them with three receptions for 41 yards. He should have had a fourth reception. He dropped nice that touchdown, touchdown man. Jamestown's Jamestown pride, but it's good yeah. to see him after uh, things didn't work out with the Browns that he was back on the roster and involved. A bubble guy, obviously, but um, you know I I like the Bills' depth at, at tight end, but who knows? Maybe they bring Tyree Jackson back this time, uh, the tight end version rather than the quarterback who played in a final preseason game not too long ago as the Bills starter. Right, of course, R.I.P. Bob Barker, John, who passed away at 99 years old. Curious because of our age difference. Bob Barker, to me, was staying home sick, watching The Price is Right, a bowl of chicken noodle soup and some saltines. But then in later years, I think he's more remembered for Happy Gilmore and his role in that movie, then some at this point may think of him from The Price is Right. Oh, he will. He was always The Price is Right for me. Yeah. I love The Price is Right. Drew Carey, Cleveland guy. <laughs> I, it just, it's not the same, right? It's just when these legends get replaced, it, it's, it's a really tall task to do. And Drew Carey's fine, but he's not Bob Barker. Right. Bob Barker was awesome. And... I think what makes the Happy Gilmore so funny is because of knowing him as Bob Barker from uh, The Price is Right. So it was cool. I saw you know, a few people, clever tweets saying, man, he was Bob Barker, was such a legend. He, he got as close to uh, – he stayed under a dollar at right. 99 and, and change here uh, even to the very end. So yeah. RIP Bob Barker, a true, a true legend. And um, – I know our buddy Bob Gosney, when he was still uh, going on to games with me, would often give me a microphone, it seemed like, that was just like the, <laughs> yeah. the old stick that uh, Bob Barker would use on The Price is Right. Classic Bob Barker microphone. I still remember when he stopped dyeing his hair. To me as a kid, he had jet black hair, and then the next season, just totally white. And as a little kid, it, I, I couldn't wrap my head around how his hair could go white that fast. John, we have uh, Cut Down Day coming up on Tuesday. We'll have another podcast coming your way, everybody, on Wednesday. Once the dust settles, hope to hear from Bill's general manager, Brandon Bean, this week as uh, the 53-man roster gets set. And then now, hard to believe, but... We say this every year. The summer is gone. The NFL season is upon us. College football actually got underway, so there's real football going on. And uh, here we are. John and I will be back here again on Wednesday with a fresh Buffalo End Zone podcast. As always, thanks for tuning in. <laughs>